Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us to talk about live captioning today. We have a wonderful panel here. All of us have been working on the problem of captioning live video online. And our goal today is to share what we've learned, what we're working on, and really engage in a conversation with all of you about what you're trying to solve for and try and set you up with, with the right questions to ask and um, how, to, how to solve for live captioning in your environments. So I'll start with some quick introductions. I'm Heather. I work as a live video producer at LinkedIn and actually have a background in, in broadcast, worked for over a decade and launched captioning on a nationwide television channel back in the early 2000s. Um, so when I got to LinkedIn and last year and they were looking to add captioning to actually internal meetings, initially I raised my hand. So um, I don't think I really had an appreciation for how challenging it would be, but I've learned a ton in the process and gotten to, gotten to meet all of these wonderful people and learn even more. So Jake? I'm uh, Jake Dozier. I work with SDI Media. Um, I'm the manager of their access services division. So uh, we're a live captioning vendor, and we also produce audio description for the blind. Hi, I'm Matt Zatmary. I work at Twitch. Um, I'm a senior video engineer there working on transcoding and playback and now on the captions project as well. Um, I'm also the author of an open source captions project called LibCaption. Um, Google it. It's open source. and if it, you guys can use it, please, please do. I'm Rob Dillon. I'm the uh, digital operations manager for Tribu Tribune Media. So I'm kind of here to give a traditional broadcaster's input to how we have to deal with captions because it's legally mandated that we provide them. Uh, we have 42 TV stations, of which 37 are news producing, of which produce 2,000 hours a week of live stream news. I'm Ben Cruz. Um, I work at Google, um, and I am a YouTube video accessibility evangelist. Um, basically, that means spreading the word both internally and externally about uh, making sure captions are added to videos. Um, I got my start working with captions. I had a production company where we did an international uh, kind of training series and offered it in you know, multilingual uh, series. And I really care about captions, and that's why I'm here to help out with best practices. Thank you, everybody. Out of curiosity, are there people in the room who are currently trying to caption video, uh, live video online? Okay, great. Well, please chime in with any questions or uh, your, own, your own lessons as we go along. So I wanted to start by um, talking about who benefits from captioning. I think um, sometimes we might forget that, that they're actually beneficial to everyone, um, from comprehension to just different environments, loud environments or digital displays. Um, uh, there's some huge search benefits in SEO, um, and then other content en enhancements that are made possible when there's uh, captioning. And obviously, there's uh, huge benefits to different communities of deaf people, second language learners, and others. Um, so just some basics really quick. Um, I think this group uh, here can appreciate the unique challenges that come with trying to caption live versus video on demand. So. Um, some of the differences are you know, pretty obvious, but um, when you think about it, it makes the problem even harder to solve when it comes to accuracy, um, you know, really limited opportunities to get it right, although there's some great captioners out there who are really fast, and if you watch carefully, you'll see them correcting things on the fly. It's pretty amazing what they can do. Um, as far as timing goes, there's delays. There's some great hardware solutions out there that can help close those gaps. Um, but that's another challenge. And then um, really the biggest one is compatibility um, in the, the live space online um, uh, with standards. And we'll get into a lot of that in just a minute. Um, and then uh, worth mentioning just that um, there's a difference between closed and open captions. Open captions are burned into the video signal, whereas closed captions are decoded and, and can be controlled on the player side by the viewer. Um, and therein lies the challenge. Um, unlike the broadcast world, it's not an end-to-end -end, uh, solution right now, which is why we're all here. Um, and then another thing worth mentioning is um, if, you, if you watched captioning, you'll notice there's at least two different kinds. There's roll-up, which really lends itself to the live solution, and then pop-on or block, which is actually really hard to implement in maybe for this type of program where there's constant narration um, and, it's, and it's coming live, it's, it's hard to get that timing right using pop-on or, or block. Um, 
So there's some challenges there across the different platforms, whether they support roll up or pop on um, in, in live or, or on demand situations. Um, so here I'm gonna lean on the panel to talk a little bit about um, the different standards that exist and, and um, some of the challenges that we have um, using these live online these days. Definitely. Uh, well, for live captioning, what we've found for streaming platforms is um, it's still easiest to use 608, 708 captions with closed captioning encoders. Um, more platforms seem to be able to pass them through um, as opposed to a live captioner uh, directly connecting to them and sending a different standard or a different style. Um, what we've run into uh, with streaming platforms is everybody seems to have their own uh, flavor or uh, format that they, that they uh, like. So I know that, uh, that Matt's done some research. Yeah, we, we found the similar thing. So um, 608, 708 is supported out of the box in iOS, so that makes it really easy to get your mobile right there. Obviously, on the ingest side, there's existing broadcast hardware um, from the EEG box, which we discussed yesterday, I think we all end up using, um, you know, plugged into an elemental, and it kind of solves the ingest problem. It makes the job on the transcoding side a little bit easy because it can just kind of pass them through. It has to pull them out and put them back in depending on your workflow. But you can pretty much just ignore them as long as it's attached on the way back out. Um, and then when you get to the player, that's where support sort of starts breaking down. I know a lot of players are supporting it these days. I know HLSJS supports 608, 708. Right. I think VideoJS does by extension then because I believe that's how they do HLS. I think JW Player does it. I think so, um, <clears throat> we wrote our own at Twitch, and part of that code is the libcaption project that I open sourced. So in my end of the world, <clears throat> again, it's kind of a blessing or a curse because I work for a traditional broadcaster, so we've been doing this for legally mandated for over 30 years. Um, so our industry has kind of driven the entire 608, 708 standard, and um, the reason for that is uh, if we don't do it, anything that is broadcast on TV that we turn around either simulcast or live stream, we are legally required to caption and to provide customizable, customizable captions, so font, color, size, background. Um, and if we don't, uh, we can be fined up to $50,000 per occurrence. So that's a little bit more of an incentive on our side than a lot of the pure digital plays have. But going back to what you were saying about the different flavors, you know, I send a standardized broadcast 608 or 708, depending on the technology stack at my stations, and I still have players that cannot interpret it correctly. Right. So um, there's a couple players I would love to use that I can't because it comes out, you know, we've all seen a closed caption that comes out with looks like Beetle Bailey cussing. Um, Beetle Bailey, I just aged myself. Uh, <laughs> um, and that happens a lot with players where even the players don't, implement the standards correctly. Right. Yeah, I see a range. I mean, luckily at Google, <clears throat> what I'm pushing for are kind of the web standards, so you'll see on this list web VTT, and that's hopefully where everyone's gonna align and things are gonna move forward. Um, you know, also thinking about 608, 708 compatibility. Um, I know the jump from 608 to 708 added certain things like Unicode support, am I wrong, or? It, it, yeah, 708 yeah. added it. It's most, we talk about 608, 708, but most implementations, 708 is limited to 608 compatibility mode, so it's 608 with a 708 header on it. That's what most implementations end up doing. So if you if you have a implementation with a fully fully implemented spec, yes, um, but yeah, again, yeah. who You're not some players <laughs> implement it, some don't. Yeah. Excellent. Well, yeah. So with Web BTT, I mean, I'm just kind of looking at um, you know HTML5, kind of adopting that, um, you know, seeing more native captioning on the web. Like I've seen great kind of separation of the captions from the video content itself. So you, know, you actually don't have to worry about your words covering up the video if you kind of present it a different way. Say you have the text below the actual video frame. Um, so those are kind of allowances that we might get in the future thanks to these standards. It would, in our experience, WebVTT is, is great for on demand. It's lacking in live, um, particularly, you know, the, the easiest way to deliver it right now is to deliver the whole file at once. 
And obviously, you can't do that for live. You have to right. deliver it in, in segments. You, you actually end up with two streams going at once, which yeah. stresses the technology we have now because you're streaming the, the text for the captions and you're streaming the video and trying to get them to sync up. So right. um, hopefully, that will keep continue to evolve. While we're on standards, Matt, I'd love to hear you talk some more about some of the innovations that are possible if we can sort of move away from some of the older standards and embrace uh, some new ways of, of doing things, if you could talk about that a bit. Um, yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, the 608, 708, it gets the job done. And again, we're, I think most of us are using it because we kind of got some free players on Apple's side. We got some free, not free, very expensive encoders on the other side, but at least they exist. Um, a lot of the technology, you know, the, the, from the web perspective, everything wants to be software-based, obviously. So there's not a lot of encoding hardware that you can buy off the shelf. There's not a lot of solutions you can buy off the shelf. A lot of the existing stuff, um, everything on there except for CEA and SEMTI is basically on demand only. So um, you know, WebVTT is where the W3C wants to go and where you know, the browsers want, want to go. Um, but as I said, it's lacking. So the future probably looks like some sort of extension to WebVTT to allow for um, live corrections and segmentation and um, maybe in-band transmission. Um, those conversations are just starting now, though. So that will take minimum 12 months to be in browsers. And Jake, on the, on the content creator side, what have you found in, with the clients that you're working with? Um, one, one of the challenges that we run into a lot is um, we'll have people that want to do live captioning, uh, but they don't want to uh, either invest in the hardware to, to get it done, or uh, we can get it all the way through, but then the player can't decode it. Um, so, you know, we've really had the most luck with 608, 708, because we're set up to do it, and uh, most things will pass it through. But there's a challenge in that for the content creator, because we, as the captioner, still need to connect to something to uh, get it into the stream. Uh, and a lot of, uh, especially with streaming uh, folks, um, they're not really set up with that infrastructure. And, and you know, there's considerable cost added there too. Which right, absolutely. Added, you know, human human transcription is still the best way to do it, and and there's a cost, and it's definitely. You know, we were we've been speaking, and there's things I can't really let out, but it's a very expensive part of our digital um, setup and our broadcast setup. What we pay the human side sure. of it. So. Well, one of the things that STI Media has done uh, to kind of not really combat that, but to make it more friendly uh, price-wise for content creators is we use voice writers as opposed to traditional stenographers. And kind of how that works, uh, some people call them re-speakers, but we're using speech-to-text software. Uh, and we actually have a person listen uh, to an audio feed uh, of the live show, and then they repeat everything they hear with also verbal commands or uh, verbal macros, if you will, to add punctuation and uh, some formatting a little bit. And, you know, I think most, maybe wrong here, I think most traditional uh, captioning is around $200 an hour. We're more like 100 So we've been able to pass some of that cost saving on in our labor um, to the content creator. I'd like to add, it's really cool to see, like, just YouTube, a video clip of how, how it actually is behind the scenes. And it's, it's just mind-boggling how people process things, like, simultaneously. It's an interesting so talent, yep. for sure. <laughs> and it, it gets, you know, gets around certain limitations, like, um, like we were talking yesterday, like proper names and, like, things sure. like branded names. Like, that's all very careful. And so if you have a voice writer, then they can have certain macros that kind of correct for those right. things. That, yeah. And you might think, well, if I can do that with audio and speech-to-text software, why don't I just run the audio feed through some software? And what, the reason why you, you can't really do that is the software can't differentiate between uh, noise and words. So if there's music in your program audio, uh, it's going to try to sign words to it. Um, we use Dragon, naturally speaking. Uh, for our speech to text, and our voice writers have voice models that are trained to their voice. Um, 
So it's able to be a lot more accurate than, say, just running the audio through a speech-to-text um, software. And then also you get things where we can make macros for specific words. Like with LinkedIn, we can make sure it renders with the capital I and everything. Yeah, uh, Rob, I think you've got some interesting anecdotes on what it's like to manage a, a team of captioners. But I can say, in my experience working with um, Jake's team with the voice writers, the accuracy is, is really great. And I think if, if you have worked um, with captioning services, you might have an appreciation for the challenges there are in traditional transcription. There's, um, it's, it takes years to train a transcriptionist to be accurate, and I think um, voice writing, the, the training time is uh, more like months. Yeah. Um, so when you think about scale um, and also affordability, that the, that the cost is lower, um, as we have more and more content online, we're going to need to scale, and, and this seems like a much more scalable solution. Um, anything to add, Rob, from managing your, some of the anecdotes you were talking about with localization, I thought was, would be interesting for this crowd, too. Um. And we, we have um, certain people assigned to certain markets and to certain people in those markets. So, you know, an anchor in Huntsville, Alabama has her own transcriptionist and learns the area so that um, they know the, the local pronunciations and they know how, you know, what was the one I said yesterday? Like, um, you know, Albany, New York is not pronounced the same way as Albany, Georgia and knowing the differences and, and customizing for that market, which is one of the challenges, again, with being you know, locally focused and having 42 different TV stations is that each market's different, so we have to train people for their market. They may not live in that market, but they're sometimes isolated right down to the actual anchor that they're assigned to. So, Definitely. so the slide I have up it was Looks just like, an attempt to, oh, sorry. Take, we'll take a question. Okay. The what? So Brightcove oh. supports 608. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'll make that correction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go in and do that right now. So this slide. Um, Live fact checking. <laughs> <laughs> this slide was just, a, just an attempt to summarize and not, not comprehensive at all, um, but summarize some of the, the widely used platforms and where they are when it comes to live and video on demand caption support. Um, I think we have people from some of these companies in the room. Um, so at LinkedIn, we're using a variety of these platforms. We've used YouTube and Ustream with great success. It's worth mentioning that this session is live streaming and we are not captioning it. We realized that last night. Um, and we really should have <laughs> captioned it. So I agreed with, um, with the folks here at Streaming Media that we would um, aim to do that next year. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be great to see Platforms like Facebook, um, I expect that they will add support for live captioning in the future. It'll be interesting to see what happens there. Anything I, else on the platform? I would say the Facebook is always a challenge for us again as a traditional broadcaster because of Facebook Live and the, the stations wanting to go, you know, put their severe weather coverage or anything online. You know, again, we've got the law that if we're broadcasting it, it has to be captioned. Facebook doesn't give us captions yet but I do know that they are testing it because we've had it show up in a broadcast that we didn't do anything to turn it on. So I know Facebook is testing it. So hopefully that will solve our issues and it will also help us as a whole as an industry where you know, the biggest player, whether we believe them when they tell us they want to be a media company or not, the biggest player in our space right now when it comes to streaming actually supports captions. That's going to be huge. I guess I'd like to add, um, just thinking about the kind of end user experience, you know, wh why are these captions important? Um, you know, a lot of the ways people are consuming things these days are changing drastically. So uh, just thinking like on a cell phone, um, you probably can't hear too well on the speakers or if you have kind of like a built-in head uh, headset or something, it just won't sound great. So captions are actually extending accessibility to, to everyone. Uh, I, I guess that's the point I want to drive home is like, 20% of cap or 20 of users who use video captions are deaf and hard of hearing, but that means 80% aren't actually deaf or hard of hearing. There's and so many reasons why people use captions. And to add in that, in iOS 10, um, in previous versions of iOS, video would not autoplay when you loaded a web page. In iOS 10, 
you actually can do autoplay if the video is muted when it's autoplays. So there's an example, a perfect example of um, captions being able to bring people in because a muted video with captions is going to be way more effective than a muted video without. Well, too, I think there's some value added for businesses, too. I mean, um, <clears throat> if you are, uh, say, uploading your content to Facebook and you add captions to it, uh, not Facebook, uh, YouTube, uh, Google will actually index your captions and uh, it'll up your SEO by a lot. Um, we have one client that does uh, a lot of things on YouTube and uh, they told us once they started adding our captionings that their SEO went up by 10%. Um, also, if you're a corporate uh, client, another great thing about captioning your live events is uh, you have a transcript pretty much directly afterwards. Um, so that's another value add to it. So there, there's, there's business cases for, for doing it as well. Yeah. Other than accessibility. I mean, just, I just read a stat yesterday about how uh, videos on YouTube that have same language captions, so not even translated to other languages, uh, those have a 4% increase in viewership just because they have captions. Um, and with translated captions, that number goes even higher. Yeah, so some real benefits on viewership there, too. Um, so, um, Let's get into some of the some of the challenges in a little bit more detail. This is a, a not a very um, beautiful slide, but I think it summarizes some of the um, some of the details around what we're facing when we try to implement uh, live captioning. Some of these we've touched on, um, and I personally at LinkedIn, um, you know, we've the internal um, player that we use for our company All Hands doesn't support closed captioning, so we ended up creating two events, one with burned in captions and one without. It's not a great user experience for obvious reasons. So um, I'd love to see, you know, I'd love to come back next year and say that we, we don't have to do that anymore because we've got a, a player that supports true closed captioning. Um, any, other, any other points you guys want to add? I guess so one of the, our main challenge being a captioner is just whenever we have to deal with someone who's exclusively streaming as opposed to a traditional broadcast is just um, it comes down to what player are you using what uh, what's the platform uh, where do, what am I connecting to um, one of the, yeah. the things I just add to what you mentioning the open captions and and what we had to do is you know, and we've had this conversation among us while we were planning how it doesn't seem like a lot of the equipment we need is there or has been thought out or anything like that. Well, we can go back four years ago when the FCC mandate hit that I had to have captions on my online streams. Nothing existed. So we did open captions as you were doing. Uh, none of the players supported anything yet. It was all, it's on a roadmap, it's on a roadmap, it's on a roadmap. Um, and not only that, the encoders weren't passing it through correctly, so uh, we did open captions and the complaints we got from the people who didn't need captions were almost more painful than the compliments <laughs> we got for yeah. providing it. Right. Yeah, that's why we went with the two streams, um, to give people that choice. So. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to just quickly touch on um, some case studies. This is a summary of what we're doing at LinkedIn in regards to captioning. So we're, um, this year, have captioned all of our internal company all hands meetings. We have a monthly speaker series that goes live on YouTube, as well as the um, connect events that our marketing team puts on. Those actually um, were on Ustream this year. Um, so we worked with SDI and their team of voice writers to actually generate the captions. And as I said, the the accuracy is really good. It's over 90%. And I want to underscore how important that is. If, if we're having a conversation and you only understand 70% of what I say, it's not going to be a very good conversation. So I think the same is true for, for live captions. The accuracy really needs to be in the 90% for it to be a great user experience. I was as, at an accessibility event over the weekend, and someone pointed out technical compliance doesn't make it usable. Um, so just because you check. Um, you know, boxes off of a list doesn't mean that the person who's consuming the content is actually having a good experience and, and um, appreciating the content. 
So on the hardware side, we have um, some EEG encoders that we use with the CC match, which is what I was talking about before, closing that gap in the delay, because there is, without that, there is maybe 10 to 15 seconds of time between you know, the content and then the captions following. So with that feature, we can actually close that gap, and it's more like five to seven seconds. Very, sometimes it's actually right on or even leading it by a second or two, but that's all adjustable. Um, and the way that works is we send um, the program audio into the ICAP um, software, which then Jake's team can listen to and then send their captioning data back through ICAP um, to our encoder, and then that gets um, added to the video signal, and I'll show a, a slide with the signal flow in just a second. Um, yeah, and then I mentioned some, some of the, the players that we're using with this setup. So here's, a, here's the signal flow. Um, our production switcher going through um, the captioning encoder, out through an elemental, um, and then to our various distribution platforms. Um, so you know, when we're working with YouTube, the elemental's pushing right to YouTube, and the captions come up um, you know, as a user would hope to expect with a, a little closed captioning button they can turn on and off. Some of these other uh, solutions, like I said, we have to, we have to use workarounds um, and do, do an open caption feed. Um, so uh, let's talk actually before we get to best practices, I'd love to hear um, Matt and Rob maybe get into a little bit more detail on, on, your, on your captioning case. Cases. Yeah, actually, cases. if you can like bring up the previous slide again. Sure. Um, our workflow is surprisingly similar, and I suspect <laughs> anyone who has to do live captions today, workflow is going to be a variation on this. Um, you know, we we have our own CDN, so we're not using. You know, the words are all different here, but the <laughs> lines are all the same. Um, you know, we are using an EEG and an Elemental, um, and this is the way we're doing our our large events today. Um, but it's a bit of a challenge for us because we're typically, you know, user-generated content. So we kind of have to make these special cases for the channels we need to ca caption, um, and that has to that has to change for us moving forward. So right now we have the EEG or the EEG, the caption, it's labeled CC encoder on here, and then the Elemental Live encoder. Um, we need that functionality, and it was easy for us to go out and purchase that functionality off shelf. But we don't need the hardware per se. So the direction we need to take is we need to take those two elements and make them a pure software solution. Get it right into our workflow, right into our, our ingest servers or our transcode servers, um, and move that direction. Uh, we have, you know, because right now we need a pair of these for every stream we caption. Um, we have tens of thousands of inbound streams. We can't do it. it um, along with that tens of thousands of inbound streams, of course, we're not going to be able to get humans for all of them. Um, right. We're definitely going to have humans for the foreseeable future on the important stuff. Uh, we're going to need to explore um, speech to text. It's just it's inevitable for that, that amount of content. Um, and all the stuff is coming. Uh, today, though, if you had to roll out captions in a hurry, um, it'll basically be this drawing. Hmm. Thank you. I think also, too, if you're, if you're a traditional broadcaster and you're already set up to do this for your um, for your television broadcasts, uh, it's a good, it's a good way that you can just pass it through uh, to and, a streaming like solution. A, my workflow is very similar to this, but we're 100% proprietary up till the elemental encoder. Right. And then it's my problem, my end. We send it out and we pass through 608, 708s, and on caption info, which is a traditional. Um, as for getting to that data, I think Ben had mentioned some things yesterday that they're working on that sounded really good and would bring the cost down and open this up to more people. Yeah, it's definitely our long-term vision is to you know, just kind of scale it up. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll give it a few years. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here we just uh, wanted to give some, some pointers on the things that you can do um, to create a great captioning, live captioning experience for your audience. Um, thinking really carefully, carefully about what your use cases are um, and what you want that ideal user experience to be before you even get started um, getting really clear on, on what your expectations are. Um, and then there's some of the mechanical things we talked about around scrolling versus pop-on, um, depending on the nature of your content. Like I said, something like this where it's constant talking, a, a scroll is gonna work much better 
um, if you can do that. And then um, on the content side, um, when we work with SDI, I send them, we send them as much detail as we can ahead of time, speaker names, agendas, um, program descriptions, acronyms, you know, special terms, anything that uh, will help the accuracy go up. And I really see a difference. I mean, actually, in the yeah. year that we've been doing it, it's gotten better and better. Yeah, I, I want to stress that if you're going to be working with live captioners, um, the more information you can give them, uh, the better your captions are going to be. Uh, especially if you have non-standard spellings, which a lot of uh, newer companies seem to like, or uh, non-standard names, I would say. Um, but you can never give us too much information. Someone added the HTML5 styling to this list. Is that you, is that you Matt? I may have. I don't okay. remember. <laughs> Do you, what were you talking about? Um, you know, there's... You know, basically, you know, if you're in a web company, you're either have employed or you're contracting, you know, typical, you know, stand, modern designers, you know, CSS, HTML, and being able to leverage them for this sort of uh, styling to make it match the rest of your website, match the rest of your player, um, you know, in a language that your developer is already familiar with. So it's and that's sort of one, of, those, there. one yeah. of those things, again, where the blessing and the curse of my yeah. industry um, we are legally required in our captions, as I said, they have to be able to be styled, sized, different fonts, different colors. That's what, I mean, the FCC has went further with us on the digital side than they have on the on-screen side. But then the flip side of that is it gives you guys, as these players, you know, concentrate on traditional broadcasters in their, their next developments and the roadmaps, it gives you guys much better captions to work with because the technology is already in the players, so. Any other uh, best practices you guys want to call out that you mentioned already? I, I, one thing that, that comes up sometimes for us is it's important uh, for the, the delay that you're going to get with live captioning that you get your captioner pre-broadcast delay audio. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times people ask me, well, well, can't you guys just watch it on TV as it plays? Or I've gotten that one. You laugh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, can you just watch our live YouTube feed and do it for there? Um, it's really important that you, you do get them the pre-broadcast delay audio or your captions will be so far behind that uh, it'll just be kind of, it'll be pointless. That's a really <laughs> good point. Yeah. And I, I've actually had the opposite problem where some of the solutions we looked at that were provided by players uh, were way too far ahead. Um, oh, really? Yeah, because they were getting pre-delay pre audio and there was no compensation for that. And so right. this is really kind of a confusing experience to be reading something that's you know th 20 seconds or 30 seconds ahead of the program Definitely. Uh, in progress. So on both sides, getting that timing right is really important to a great experience. Um, so uh, quickly, we just wanted to touch on some of what's ahead. I think we're all uh, waiting for the FCC to come out with a broader mandate for um, online content. Some things are in place. Um, I think, Rob, probably you're the best one to talk about what's out there now and what you see I, I think what the FCC and the reason why they are going to start regulating digital as soon as they get that um, mandate is because of, or not mandate, but the, they're allowed to do so, which as it becomes, as internet and, and online services become more and more of a commodity or, or be regulated like a utility, um, again, not trying to make Facebook the bad guy, but their push into live video is going to make the FCC really, I'm sure they're already getting complaints on Facebook not being captioned, and they don't have the authority at this time to make Facebook do anything. But I see that coming, and that'll trickle down to the rest of us. Do we want to add anything on WebVTT? Um, Matt, I think you added this point. Yeah, I'm not sure if I have too much more to add. Basically, um, we, something has to come. It might not be WebVTT. The reason why we keep coming back to WebVTT is this is where it seems like a lot of people are pushing. The browsers are going this way. It's part of W3C. It's becoming, it's becoming an internet standard. Um, it still doesn't fit our needs for live. So um, I think the lowest, lowest 
pa uh, resistance path right now is probably going to be extending WebBTT as opposed to coming up with something new. Um, you know, because we can design protocols and and standards all day, but in, in the end, we need everyone to implement them. Um, so um, we did actually. There was a conference called FOMS in San Francisco a few weeks ago, and we did we did discuss some of this at that conference, uh, particularly with people at the W3C and and at, and at Google. But um, like I said, we're just these were initial conversations. Um, that's definitely the direction that they seem to like. Um, 608, 708, we keep mentioning. Um, it is a very old standard. Um, the library I've mentioned several times is, is an encoder decoder. And if you go look at the code for that, it's, it's, the way it's been upgraded over the years is very interesting. It's, <laughs> you, know, you, have, you have 14 bits per field of video. It's, it's very non-internet-like. It's, it, it, it's basically a digital wrapper on top of an analog standard with a back compatibility mode and a new 708 header that maybe lets you do more stuff if you have someone to implement it. And the, the standard is just, is just old. It's, we're running out of code words. There's only 16,000 possible code words and 14,000 of them already claimed. So it's, it's, it can't be extended much more. It's difficult to parse. It's difficult to encode. Um, <clears throat> But it does do the job today, and um, you know it does have codes for backspace and clear line and carriage return and roll up and you know set position and everything. And it even has support for colors and limited font. Um, so all that stuff is there, and that's why we're using it today. And VTT has a lot of that, not all of it, um, not enough to make it suitable for today for live, but. Um, I suspect that some sort of live profile added to WebVTT will be the future, but time, time will tell. Time will tell. Yeah, we have um, five more minutes, and I, I don't know that we'll solve all of the world's live captioning problems in those five minutes. Um, but I did want to, I did want to call out that um, this is a very North America-focused conversation. Obviously, um, we haven't even talked about how to add other languages to that. Um, and I know in other parts of the world they're doing a better job. So I just want to um, acknowledge that um, we have a lot, lot more work to do. And um, at this point, I th we would love to talk about that with you all, hear what you're up to, any questions you have, um, ideas. Um, I know we have some folks, some hardware folks and platform folks in the room. Um, so I'll open it up to you all. Yes. Um, so well, the, can you repeat the oh question? Oh, yes. So what is not suitable today in WebVTT to make it live? So the WebVTT standard itself basically says you have to have the whole, the file for the whole, the, everything pre-captioned. You deliver the file as one chunk of all the text in there. Well, live, you don't know what the person's going to say until they've said it. So you can't create the file, so you can't deliver the file because the file doesn't exist until the end of the stream. Um, there's also things with corrections. You know, um, we use, we've used re-speakers, but we've also used uh, stenographers, and they have a backspace key on their keyboard. They can hit back. Uh, there's no backspace in a text file. There's no such thing. Um, those are a few things. There are ways around it, because in the browser, you can actually take the WebVTT element and pass it into the browser as what's called a queue. So you can, you can do that, but there's no standard way of transmitting cues. Um, there's no standard like protocol for that. So basically what, like, uh, uh, I believe JW Player, I don't want to talk on their behalf, but I believe what they're doing is converting 608 to 708 into VTT cues and then giving them into the browser. And they're kind of having to short circuit the whole path to get into like a VOD style workflow in the browser. Um, we do something similar. We don't bother to put it into the browser because we wrote our own player, so we just render it straight out. We don't use the browser as a middleman. Um, but yeah, yeah, mostly just just transmission. Um, it's out of band, which is a little more challenging. Now you have to have two systems that are in time sync that might be completely different. Um, so they have to have some sort of time code to keep synchronized. Um, 
Whereas if you put them in band, then the time code is just right in, right in band with the video, uh, which makes it a lot, a lot easier on the player <coughs> end. Um, that's off the top of my head, yeah. And, and to add to what Matt said there on our side, I've got a, a vendor I'm working with experimentally on the, the future and one of the things that we've discussed and uh, that actually takes the 608, 708s out, writes a virtual web VTT and then spits that back out and the translation technology is just not there right now. It, it comes out horrible. I mean, it, it's garbled. Um, it comes out backwards. Uh, we were working with it for like a month where we couldn't figure out why I was getting what the anchor said five minutes later first and what she was saying then might show up 15 minutes later. It, so it's hard to keep the time codes straight based off of the 608, 708 standards. It's not yeah. that WebVTT is confused, it's just the way our standards work and trying to translate it into something that makes sense to and, a new technology instead of a 30-year-old. And that's actually a point I should have brought up to answer that question too, is WebVTT requires a start point and end point. 608, 708 is only a start point. So you don't know, you don't know when the next word is gonna be spoken. You don't know how long to leave this on the screen until the next thing comes on to replace it. Right now with the queue, you have to guess. And if you guess wrong, you then have to requeue a new one at the exact same time. So your captions are actually swapping behind the scenes. It's just hopefully it does it in less than a frame so no one sees it. Um, that's another big issue is, is the, the, the requirement for an end time per, per, per VTT queue. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. But you know, how do you, where do you think the FCC will go for things that are, that are reaching very niche um, markets? And how do you think small content providers will be affected? Things that, streams that might be three minutes or an hour or small niche shows? I will tell you that dealing with the FCC, they've been very lenient even with us as large broadcasters um, on deadline dates and, and things, you know, they'll hold the fine over our heads, but I haven't ever seen one given out. My personal belief is just like um, a lot of the other governmental agencies is that they will have levels. So are you this big? Well, then you have to have this much. If you're huge, like us, a traditional broadcaster, we have to do it all the way. Uh, if you're doing a, a three minute clip, live clip on uh, to a like you said, to a niche audience, I don't see them requiring it right away. It may be something they put on their roadmap like they did for us. Uh, starting next year, we have to have all our VOD captioned as well, which we have never had to do before. But they gave us a 10-year lead time on it. So they, they're not going to come down with an iron hand and say, you will do this now. Uh, they've learned a lot from forcing us to do things that makes them realize that you, we can't do things that you tell us to do if the technology is not there or if it's cost prohibitive. And they are very um, aware of the smaller uh, players like in the expanding digital. They know there's not just three networks anymore. So I'll, I think it's coming and Facebook is going to be driving it, but I think there'll be definite exceptions. I, just to add to that, I think um, I would love to see us as an industry solve this or at least get closer to solving it before it even needs to be mandated. I'd love for the creators of short form content online, you know, niche audiences to be able to add live captioning and on-demand captioning um, without it being a huge expense and um, without having to face some of the challenges that we talked about today. So um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation. So it is time. Thank you all so much for joining us today and uh, look forward to talking about this more in the future. Thanks, everybody.